Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the session. We're looking forward to our conversation with these visionary leaders who have really done a lot of thinking and um, reflected on their work as they've become impact investors through the years. Each of them has a different story to tell, and I think lots of reflections for us to learn from. The theme of this session is around uh, thinking about their individual journeys and how they have tried to bring together collective influence from their own action in uh, the impact investing area. I'm going to do a quick round of introductions, but before that, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Urmi Sangupta. I work with the MacArthur Foundation. The foundation has been an active impact investor for over three decades. It's deployed a little over half a billion in that space across regions and across sectors. Uh, we're very excited to be here having this conversation. Part of my mandate is uh, to help build the field. In that context, uh, we've uh, made a grant to the impact, which we'll talk about a little bit um, in the conversation today. But I'm going to launch off by introducing our panelists. Sitting next to me is Kristen. Kristen is an impact investor herself and um, also a member of the impact. Um, she, um, many of you know her as the fearless leader of NIA, and uh, she also works to empower other family organizations and individuals, and, as well as uh, enterprises in their own impact investing journeys and helping them align uh, their investments with value. Josh um, has been a co-founder of, is a co-founder of Impact, uh, along with uh, Abigail, who is the CEO. And Josh has been uh, active in the space for a very long time. He's a very committed impact investor and brings a lot of expertise and experience as a venture capitalist, uh, his experience in the technology field, um, and then is the CIO of a family office right now. So welcome, Josh. Uh, we have Martin sitting next to him. Martin is a serial entrepreneur, has spent over 26 years in this uh, spaces of clean tech, um, energy, and, and as well as high tech uh, enterprises, has uh, closed transactions of over $7 billion in value. So welcome to the conversation. And then we have uh, Abigail at the very end, who is the CEO of Im The Impact. Uh, the Impact is a network of uh, family organizations that are committed to making investments with measurable social impact. So I'm, I'm going to pause there and just go straight into the questions. So my first question is something I would like to hear a little bit from Josh and Abigail on. Uh, and, and maybe, Abigail, you can start off. You know, what changes have you seen in the impact investment space over the last decade or so? And, and what do you attribute these developments to? Sure. Well, first off, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today um, and here at SOCAP. Um, I think SOCAP has been a fundamental part of the the catalyzation of um, the impact investing space. Um, so the first time I came to SOCAP in 2010, um, the conference was a lot smaller and it really felt like impact investing was still this niche area um, and it was only a small group of people who were thinking about it. Um, and some of those people are on this panel today like Kristen and Josh. Um, and I was working at the World Economic Forum uh, and within the World Economic Forum, it was a topic that just wasn't yet discussed. Um, and so we created an initiative there um, called From the Margins to the Mainstream, How Do We Harness the Hype of Impact Investing? And I think today it is no longer a hype. And you can see that from how many people are here in these halls of staff, <coughs> how many people have sophisticated strategies on impact investing, and that this really is a mainstream conversation. Um, I joined the Impact in 2015 um, to build it into a membership network and a global community. Um, and over the past several years, what we've seen is that there are so many values aligned investors, so many families who have capital that they want to um, deploy with measurable impact. Um, and it's family offices, family foundations, and increasingly family businesses. Um, so we're seeing a lot more diversity of investors in the Impact investing space. We're also seeing a lot more diversity of impact investment destinations, different sectors, different theories of change, um, and that this really is a part of so many strategies. It's not something that is just an afterthought, but it is a main part of the strategy. Um, so the impact investing sector has evolved significantly over the years. Um, we're really excited um, that 
SOCAP has been a great part of this movement, as well as organizations like The Impact that is bringing families um, at all starting points into the impact investing conversation um, and helping them you know, develop investment policy statements, do learn the best practices of do, 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 doing due diligence on direct investments, thinking about intergenerational dialogue and bringing along other family members, working with their CIOs and engaging um, family office staff and wealth advisors in the process. So um, we're proud of where we are and I think there's a lot more yet to come. Thank you. Josh, hearing a little bit from you on the same topic of where you've seen the changes through the years. It's pretty much the same. Uh, there, there's always been thousands of people deploying capital. No, I'm totally kidding. Uh, it, it's, uh, this is really exciting for me for a bunch of different reasons. It's, uh, when you first started coming to these things, you probably knew like 80% of the room, and, and now I probably know like 10% of the room. And so that in and of itself is exciting. Um, the conversations become a little bit more sophisticated. You start to see more sophisticated sources of capital, more uh, experienced money managers in the room. And so that's just part of the evolution. Like we've, a lot of the, the early players in the marketplace have reduced some of the risk and uh, there's now data to suggest that this is not crazy. Um, and so uh, happy to be here. Thank you. We'll, we'll dig into a couple of those things later, but I'm gonna- Have at it. <laughs> come to Kristen um, next. Kristen, um, you know, you've been an impact investor in your, with your own portfolio and you've begun guiding others through Nia's work as well. What is, uh, you know, how has your journey changed through the years with that and what lies ahead? Share a little bit about what you see. Sure, so I think this has been said at SOCAP. One, I just wanna thank everyone in the audience. There are so many places you could be right now. One of them is outside in the sunshine. So the fact that you're here to join us for this conversation is honoring and um, thank you. Um, and it's exciting to be here. And I love that main stage is no longer main stage. That's what's really exciting, I think, is that the conversations and the meetings that are happening at SOCAP, as Abigail's pointed out, uh, really are happening along different sectors, along different dialogues, geographies, um, and throughout the entire portfolio. So I think that has changed. It was, you know, and it's still to some degree, working with those early stage angel entrepreneurs um, is still what's considered sexy, and yet I'm really finding a loan guarantee very sexy these days. And of course, I hang out in public equities, and there's nothing more sexy than public equities right now. So as far as moving the most amount of capital, making the largest difference. So um, we are seeing some trends and changes, um, and I think the pool is getting bigger, as we know. Um, and are there fears of greenwashing and pinkwashing and advisors saying they know what they're doing when they're not? You know, that is also happening. Um, and yet, as more and more individuals, millennials, women, et cetera, consider themselves investors and identify as investors, they will stay true to those values. And of course, the people on the stage are here working to make sure that that happens, um, true to what systems change needs to be. Where, where do you see um, Nia's work going in the future? Nia, so Nia means intention and purpose, and so we are here to help align capital with intention and purpose, and so to the extent we can do that on a larger um, platform is what needs to happen. We just reached 109 um, million dollars under management, 109, oh, that's right, okay, I got that right. Um, today, we need to be at billions because the minute you have a piece of NIA in your portfolio and are receiving impact reports on a quarterly basis, you then start to say, well, why aren't the rest of my managers you know, supplying an impact report? Why aren't the rest of my uh, managers thinking about impact in this way? And um, it really can be a tool to talk to your advisor, to family members about what could investment products look like. Um, so we need to become a household name, I think, for that to happen. Her reports are great, I get that. them. Sorry. Her reports are great, I get them. Thank you, John. You just said loan guarantees are sexy and we're gonna leave that at that? <laughs> <laughs> no, we will come back and dig into that, but I'm, right. I'm gonna to switch to Martin for a little bit. So Martin, you've recently sold a business and you're building out your impact investment strategy. Tell us a little bit about you know, what's been easy in that journey, what's hard, you know, what lies ahead. Sure. Um, so my experience in the last 10 years uh, in terms of impact was uh, all of my direct investments. I had a company in uh, renewable energy, 
uh, and uh, develop large-scale solar power plants, mostly here in California. Uh, some of the power plants cover, uh, power about 10% of the city of LA. Um, and uh, now, uh, as, as I exited that business, uh, you know, I, one of the motivations for me to join uh, the impact was to understand in a peer-to-peer -peer network um, how, how to um, invest the, the, the pa my passive investments in, in a sensible way. Um, but the, the most passionate I'm still on, on direct investment, so the reason why I um, divested from my last uh, um, company was because there's a clear shift uh, in, in the market uh, in the last 10 years of power plants we developed. Uh, we and others uh, were kind of in a niche, and uh, since it's clear since 2016 that solar is ready to get from a niche to, to mainstream. The question is just how does it work? And one of the parts is, is the, you know, the, the topic of this conversation, which is how can we mobilize uh, funds on, on large scale? Uh, there are $270 trillion in, in institutional money uh, in the Western vaults, and only a tiny little fraction goes into renewable right now. And um, the, it's not that there is a lack of interest. I think that there's a, a, a big interest of institutional money to invest into, into the transformation in the electric sector. Um, it's the question are what are the hurdles for so, so that we can mobilize those funds. And some of the hurdles are um, like the growth markets uh, are non-OECD non uh, countries. Um, we're engaged in, uh, in, in Asia, for instance, in addition to the U.S., and um, investors face challenges like the, or, or we developers as well as investors face challenges like uh, off-take agreements or ar arbitration, um, being paid uh, in, uh, in, in a U.S. Uh, domination or in, in euro, um, as opposed to the local currencies. Uh, these make the deals so much more uh, complex, uh, you get less, less investors that are interested. Um, on the technical side, the question is how do we, what is the system architecture to deploy renewables in order to decarbonize an entire, um, an entire uh, power grid? Um, and the, you, you will accomplish the decarbonization the fastest if you deploy it at the lowest cost, but what is the lowest cost? That's, that's, a non, a non, um, that's not a simple uh, answer. And, and finally, uh, a lot of the inst big institutional investors, they want to write big check size. They want to write like 500 million. They want to engage <coughs> with 500 million and, and larger checks. Uh, so you basically need to aggregate your projects to, to reach to the check size. So none of this is rocket science. And, and, and we, as well as a lot of other people, are working on, on this. Um, and I'm pretty optimistic that uh, uh, country by country, uh, these problems are get, getting addressed. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that this transformation, which is about a $13 trillion transformation, is going to happen much faster than most people think. And it's basically because it's a trade-off without regret. So it's not that renewable is not only clean, but it's clean and cheap. And whenever you have that value proposition, uh, it's, it's going to be a, um, a, a strong motivation for, for the utilities to, to go and, and buy either solar or wind at storage to it, et cetera. And that, that to me is something where uh, I feel like I, I can still have a, a, a direct impact and, and, and where uh, a lot of um, uh, funds can, can be mobilized. I think Thanks. this is, yeah. I was just going to say, this is really exciting because Martin, um, you built this business and you built it to be impactful in the energy space. And now you're saying, what's the next iteration of my impact? And thinking about your portfolio and new markets, and you've had an incredible career. Um, Thank you. And you continue to push the envelope on impact. Martin thinks cash is sexy because he just sold his company. <laughs> <laughs> what can we say? All forms of capital at this point, you know, are front and center. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, coming back to you, Abigail, um, just sort of building a little bit on things that Martin touched on. Um, you know, you've seen engagement with families across countries and across areas of interest through the work that you're doing with Impact. What are some of the exciting, uh, you know, trends and changes you're seeing that will help us sort of get past some of the hurdles that Martin talked about and where we see, you know, sometimes they, somebody, you know, a network like the Impact 
taking specific sort of initiatives and putting them together and sometimes just sort of responding to interest in, in the, among the members to do certain things. Yeah. I'm really glad you asked this question because it allows me to highlight the project that we undertook with the support of the MacArthur Grant, um, which is a heat mapping survey of the impact investing space. Um, and what we heard from our members, uh, 32 families replied, was that water overall globally is an area that families and asset owners want to invest more in, but there are not enough opportunities. Um, food and agriculture closely follow. Um, but also that a lot of families feel like they're not getting the expertise from their wealth advisors um, and from you know, in-house staff on impact. And that is holding them back from being able to deploy more capital meaningfully into impact investing. So um, what I see in the future is that a lot more investment professionals will have this impact expertise um, and a lot more banks um, and wealth advisors will be in a position to help their clients um, make more impact investments. Um, so I'm really excited about that change, um, and thank you to the MacArthur Foundation for continuing um, to help us with this research. We also have been working with the Omidyar Network on a project uh, called Collective Influence, because um, we realize that when, and we've heard from our members that when one person goes to the bank and says, listen, I'd like to divest of private prisons, or I'd like to understand the climate change risk of my portfolio, their advisor might say, that's interesting, but we don't have that much demand for this kind of product, for this kind of service. But when you have five or 10 or 50 people, um, clients, influential clients coming to you, and that voice is unified, and you keep hearing the same um, interest and the same demand, you're gonna address that. So through the impact, we're able to listen to all of our members, aggregate their voice, reflect that back out to the market, and change the way that service providers, um, RIAs and private banks and intermediaries are engaging in the impact investment market, serving their clients, um, and make sure that we are able to uh, you know, get more impact product, more impact services out there, and mobilize more capital toward impact. That's, uh, and I think those are two ex distinct examples of two different areas where we know there are constraints that are holding back greater participation and uh, greater engagement from both sort of newer actors, but those who are already in the space and who want to be doing a lot more than they are able to do right now. Um, I want to come back to you, Kristen, and, and maybe ask a little bit more specifically from your vantage point, you know, where do you see the most compelling opportunities for investors to sort of you know, join forces or harmonize their voices in order to catalyze market level change? Sure. So I would say, particularly from people like us on this stage who have by definition, I think joining the impact, we have more than enough. And so by making sure that we're asking ourselves how much is enough um, and really ready to deploy everything more than what we have and what we need for our own families is going to be really essential. Um, so, and I know that things are tricky in the U.S. with healthcare being so uncertain. We all want to, you know, save a little bit both for our parents and what is it. So, um, I would say that we're going to have to get healthcare policy down so that we can all actually answer how much is enough. How much is it going to cost us to live this lifetime? Um, so let's tackle healthcare. I know that's another panel somewhere else, but <laughs> it does influence how we think about what we can deploy in the U.S. Um, and then really recognizing where are the numbers. Um, the financial industry isn't serving people or planet. I think we're all here because we agree about that. Um, no offense to the beautiful white men in this room and on stage, but with men controlling over 90% of our economy, we're really going to need to find more balance. So what can investors do? We really need to invest in balanced teams. The research is there that they're more innovative. The revenues are there that oftentimes they can be considered <coughs> a better investment, but it really is where we collectively can put our dollars into women, people of color, founders, and diverse teams. Um, and then, of course, when we can intersect that with environmental sustainability, um, I think that's where the returns are going to be. That's where the alpha is going to be. It's also where our economy needs to go, in my humble opinion. Thank you. No, and, and you know, Josh, curious if 
you can build on that. Let's hear from the white guy. <laughs> there you go. We need our beautiful white men. I mean, we need everybody working on this. I love that you just called me beautiful. Can, like, <laughs> can, we just, can you call my wife and say that? <laughs> you're beautiful I also, too. you're going to say this in some form, but to really ask ourselves the question, what is the risk of not doing this investment? Um, and really shift the way we're thinking about risk. Um, but if this woman of color doesn't get seed capital from me, where else is she gonna get it? And those are the types of questions that I'm asking myself and I encourage the rest of us to really think about what is the risk of not deploying this capital right now? Yes, no, I, I, think, um, I think those are all sort of thought-provoking and difficult questions to ask. Um, Josh, you're not off the hook yet. Um, so the question to you is, yeah. you know, when you picture areas that you wanted to focus on and impact investing, you know, education, um, energy, and, and uh, safety, security, what drove you to that? And, and what were some of the challenges you saw in trying to be so focused? And, you know, we know that opportunities are hard to find, the, and it is even harder to sort of be the first actors to support um, entrepreneurs who are starting on these <coughs> journeys? I mean, at some level, I, I didn't know any better. I started making impact investments when I was 26 years old. And so I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, my journey was a reaction to the events at 9-11 and, and Ground Zero. And so my history was I was working in finance and I was working in technology and I was gonna make a lot of money and then I was gonna turn 80 and I was gonna become a philanthropist and live out my values. And there were lots of people who showed up for work on the morning of 9-11 that were on the same path, and they never got there. And so it was one of those gut check moments for me, like what would the world have said about me if that was my last day? And, and I didn't think my answers were good enough. And so I set out to find entrepreneurs that were working on tech solutions to prevent the next 9-11. Um, and, and I fortunately got backing from the Weil family from Citigroup, um, but there was no term of impact investing. Like there were no other managers that we could hire to represent our values in the marketplace. And so it was really an experiment for a few years without me knowing what the risks were and without really internalizing kind of how hard this was going to be. And we just kind of put limited amounts of dollars to work and started to do deals and we iterated over time and ultimately built out a team and a series of funds and lo and behold, uh, the world is heading in a direction which allows our jobs to be easier, which is pretty awesome. But it was always personal, and it's moved around quite a bit. And so what started as a reaction to 9-11 to is now very much about my kids. And in my family, we have uh, an instance of stroke. And so a lot of the resources that my wife and I are deploying now are related to brain health and rehabilitation. And so there's a nimbleness to this conversation. And so you, you, know, you're, you gravitate to things that are pressing at the moment at hand. And I'll always pay attention to the environmental ecosystems and healthcare, as, as you mentioned. But there's always going to be acute things as well. And so that nimbleness has been really important for me and my family. And, and as you, um, you know, over the course of these 15 years, I'm sure you've seen uh, many other investors start this journey. Uh, do you see uh, that they have a good, uh, good set of resources to help them figure the way forward, or is it more informally mentoring that, you know, people like yourselves have been doing for many of these investors? I think it's getting better. I'd like to believe the impact has paid, played a role in that, specifically mm -hmm. for single-family offices. That's really where the impact came from. And so uh, one of my co-founders is a guy named Justin Rockefeller, who's not here today, obviously, but uh, Justin's family decided in 2010 they wanted to put 10% of a pool of capital into impact investments. And two or three years had gone by, and because they were uh, with uh, a certain manager and they were in commingled pools and there weren't enough of those investors asking for impact-oriented investments, they weren't able to deploy any money in that strategy. And so Justin called up other folks that he was close to and asked, what, what does this mean? Why am I hearing this? Like, why is this so difficult? And we pulled together a bunch of friends and uh, fellow travelers and started to collectively answer that question. And the end result is building this organization. And now we have members in 18 countries around the world. And so it's a, it's a long-winded way of answering a question, but it's a question that fortunately less of us are asking as a result of having the experience of Kristen and Martin and, and others to accelerate our journeys. Thank you.
No, and, and I, think, I think there is tremendous wisdom and knowledge in knowing that once you have groups of people that are coming together, the impact is one, and we have several other networks in the field that are pulling together uh, different uh, groups of investors in, in trying to figure out how to make all of this much easier and much more um, um, easy to sort of uh, engage with, not just in understanding, but in actually making the investments. Um, Martin, my next question is to you. Um, I know when we chatted, you talked a little bit about um, seeing as an area for uh, action now this theme around uh, intergenerational equity. Can you talk a little bit about this and your, your experience and your perspectives? Sure. Um, so I have two kids, a uh, daughter with 30, a uh, son with 24, um, and for us the question was how can we integrate the kids into the family office and uh, they first were very engaged uh, merely to understand well what, what is the wealth level in, in, in the family office <laughs> once they had that insight I felt like the level of interest uh, uh, wasn't the same um, but the when we talked about well how should we what should we do with passive investment uh, should we just leave, let the wealth manager um, allocate it and then it's a black box for us? Or are we concerned about where, where these funds are invested? And that's a dialogue that they found interesting. They, and, and I feel like that to me was, a, was a, a, a moment of reckoning to say, okay, well, maybe that's the way how we can have this intergeneral dialogue and, and have our kids integrated into the family office, and, and it's not just me and my wife talking to the wealth advisors and, and investment advisors and talking about allocation, and etc. But um, basically, having there's a dialogue among the four of us, and and so by definition, they will bring in their value, which is obviously a, 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 they have a different upcoming and a different viewpoint, and and uh, that that to me is a, a very refreshing view, and uh, I found that powerful, and, and both. Um, after kids have participated in, in next generation events of the impact mm -hmm. um, and uh, came back uh, very inspired. So I, I think it's, it's a good way to, um, to structure that dialogue and, and make sure it, it has uh, some, some more meaning to it. My kids have done the same thing, and they're nine and six, and so it's, it's so not. They, they have early. as much, yeah. if not more, expertise to contribute, right? So, um, I'm going to go back oh, with a question for each of you uh, now, and Abigail will start with you. Uh, same question, I want you to sort of think about this. Um, so, if you think about members in the audience who might be thinking about ways to catalyze their own portfolios and their own work in a, in a more strategic way, uh, what advice would you give them? Hmm. Well, I would say, above all, I'll start with what you know. Um, so, um, if you have a particular passion or background in food or in fashion or in energy, that's the natural place to start with your portfolio as well, to start evaluating um, investment opportunities <laughs> related to that. Um, I would also say that you don't need to be a billionaire or centimillionaire to be an impact investor or to be thinking in a more impactful way about your decisions. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, you can be thinking about um, how you run your organization and how you make um, how you allow your employees to be more impactful. So one of the things that we've done with the impact is uh, created impact investment opportunities through the 401k. Um, and so we worked with Hip Investor um, for them to help our 401k provider um, offer impact uh, screened portfolios to our employees. That way, you know, each team member can feel like they themselves are also an impact investor. Um, we also thought hard about where our money sleeps at night. Um, it's not just in a regular bank account. Um, it's at a B Corporation bank that serves the Bronx and Harlem um, and small entrepreneurs that otherwise wouldn't be able to get a loan from a Chase or a Bank of America. Um, so little decisions like that can have a huge impact. Um, and there are also, uh, you know, retail and uh, impact investment platforms um, like Aspiration or um, Ethic and, and um, 
people can make these decisions at much smaller levels than impact members. And that's something that I just want to emphasize, even though the impact is a network of people who have an incredible, um, incredible resources at their disposal to be more impactful. It's not something that's only for the elite. Um, and with each decision that we make, consumption, investment, we can all be more impactful. Um, one of the premises of the impact is that you should, you know, the Margaret Mead quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Often that is what has changed the world. And um, people here in this audience, people at SOCAP can do that as well. Um, so start with what you know, see what opportunities are out there. Um, you know, uh, loan guarantees can be sexy. <laughs> um, and 401ks can be sexy. And just the way that you operate, um, thinking about how to weave impact into um, your enterprise, into your everyday decisions. Um, and when you one day create a energy company that you're able to exit from and start to create a portfolio like Martin. Um, you've really made it and it's exciting, but for the rest of us, um, let's start with where we are now and, and be as impactful as we can with our everyday decisions. Thank you. Martin. I think the w one key takeaway uh, fr from my side is to think about, can you do some direct investments uh, Every time I have invested money on, on my own, uh, that's when I usually make the best uh, returns. Um, also, in, when it comes to impact, uh, you, you can measure the impact uh, direct and you don't need to rely on somebody reporting you how, how well your, your, your funds are doing. Um, that's obviously something the wealth advisor, investment advisors uh, won't recommend you to do. Um, but uh, the my experience is if you rely on someone else to uh, do uh, good while doing well, then you always are dependent on, 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 that, and on, on that individual and, and you also are uh, dependent on, on the reporting system, uh, etc. Now, um, you still, it's still required to do all that, but um, I see a lot of people that uh, are rather relying giving funds to someone else than having the self-confidence and say, well, if I'm passionate about something, then I'll, I'll use a portion of my funds and I'll invest in myself and, and, and um, I'll, I'll work on what I'm passionate for. Thank you. Josh, your words of advice? Yeah, so I, I would tell people they're not afraid to be vulnerable. Part of what makes this dynamic work is that we are transparent with our, our fears and our motivations and things that we understand and quite frankly, things that we don't. And so if there are things that are intimidated about making impact investments, ask other people around you who may have a little bit more experience or a little bit more insight and be willing to take risk. Like the most important lessons I've learned come from when I've lost money, not from when I've made it. And so if you can take a little bit of risk and iterate on that process and figure out what works for you and what types of entrepreneurs are a good fit and what types of companies provide you with the best possible experience, both financial and otherwise, uh, it's, it's never too soon to get started, whether you're 6, 9, 24, 30, uh, 41. Uh, it's... You know, 29. 29. <laughs> um, this requires participation. And it's active. And so part of our goal as people deploying capital without understanding risk in a perfect way is to the reduce risk for other people because we can afford to take that risk like we've asked that question how much is too much and for that excess amount we can do things like take risk that reduces risk for others or attract additional talent to the marketplace because they know that there's capital waiting if they show up and all of those things are designed to bring efficiency to the ecosystem in ways that i think everyone will benefit over time Thank you. Kristen? Sure, so um, things that we're thinking about at NIA are how to make our own internal practices really exciting. And so we became GEN certified, Gender Equity Now mm -hmm. certification, and doing that process was so empowering to my staff. They were really excited about it. We have a manual now that we actually had a lot of the best practices that we were already doing. Now we know the research behind them. And I say this because it's not only in deploying our money. Of course, feel good about where you're banking. Feel so good about 
that, that those loans are staying in your local community, that they're going to the women small businesses that you care about for sure, make that move, but also in our regular practices and how we're building businesses and how we're talking to people you know, about what is impact and how can mm -hmm. we lead that impactful life. So definitely the businesses we choose to do, um, you know, uh, pipeline with, you know, even where we're doing our consumption makes a difference. Um, as far as getting started with some smaller investments, I love Investibule, um, the platform. Um, between $200, $1,000 can get people started. And one of the other ones is Crowdfund Main Street. And I love these because one, they're small dollar amounts, so you can, everybody can get started there. But also women, um, and particularly women of color, do better fundraising on some of these crowdsource platforms. So um, we can't ignore them when we're trying to shift capital systems. Some of these are gonna be really important. Um, and then the other one is just like this panel is about the impact and being with others and doing this work together. When you're breaking up with your bank, bring a friend, bring one. Um, and there's actually a group of women in New York, I'm forgetting their name at this moment. Um, they have t-shirts, they bring cupcakes, they have a break up with your bank party, um, and they definitely bring their friends. Um, and sometimes the tellers at the bank have been known to video this because they're all excited about these women being empowered and leaving and going off to doing their thing. So this can actually be fun work and it could be community building work and every dollar makes a difference. So um, the time is now and we're all here. Um, and uh, I actually, during my day job, I'm also a money doula. So I will hold your hand and support you as you do this work if that comes up. Thank you. Well, somebody from here hopefully will come up to you and speak to you about that right after the session. I'll hold um, your hand too, but I have no qualifications whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. So I am going to take a minute maybe to uh, ask just sort of one question of which I think would be interesting for people to hear and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we've all touched upon sort of thinking about what impact you want your money to help create and support. Um, I'm, I'm curious about just doing around and we're not doing definitions here by any stretch but when you say impact and when you talk about impact you know measurable impact with your investments uh, going back to the uh, language from the impact abigail what does impact mean to you and and just just uh, just <laughs> sort of how you think about it not not very sort of doesn't have to be perfectly phrased but i think that's helpful for people to here as they think about what they want to be doing with their own resources. Kristen, do you want to lead? I'm happy to. Yeah. Um, so we're always having impact, and I think we know this, and I think it's been said in this conference in different, uh, in different places. Um, every investment has an impact, so it's not what, whether we're gonna have an impact, but will it be positive, negative? Will it be the impact that we're intending to have? And so just being really conscious and bringing it back to both the intention um, and then the execution, but that it's not like we can just sit with some of our money in wherever it is. That's actually status quo, income and economy doing largely a large amount of destruction if we're not actually looking at that money. Mm -hmm. So indexing really is probably the demise of our economy. So moving the money out of those traditional places and putting it into something conscious, that is an incredible impact. Thank you. Josh? Um, so for me, it's, it's relatively simple. And so there's two components to the phrase. And so it's an investment. And so I'm putting money out with the expectation of getting more back. Uh, and it's designed to have an impact. Uh, I spend most of my time dealing in early stage technology in the areas of safety and care, education, and environmental companies. Um, but increasingly, I'm interested in making non-venture investments globally. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways I'm doing that is by leveraging the network and, and take, picking up on the expertise of folks that have really strong uh, domain expertise and really strong local relationships in places like Chile and uh, in Brazil and other places. And so I expect my portfolio will get more global, but impact investing exists in virtually every asset class, every sector, multiple return profiles with different strategies. Most of my time is spent on product-based impact. And so these are proactive solutions where the company's core product or core technology is affecting change. But that's just one example of ways you can make it work for you. Thank you. So we have 
kind of structured it in, in, in three categories. In, in our family, first is the direct uh, in investment uh, for what I talked earlier about in our company, Bright Night, which is basically renewable energy projects. Uh, the second one is uh, more philanthropic and, and, and uh, where we use a family foundation. And we, we try to um, be in theme of where we can add more than just writing a check for something. Like mo all of our projects, or most of our projects so far, have been in Bangladesh, where we also develop a solar power plant. Um, and we were able to fund uh, like midwife programs, uh, vocational training for midwife programs, where we were really surprised about the, the impact uh, to a community mm -hmm. uh, that, mm -hmm. that one midwife has, and uh, as she goes back to, to her local community, um, or having medical, local medical clinics specifically designed for, um, for uh, women and, and, and children. Um, and though it's not energy related, uh, the clinics are powered by solar, obviously, and, and batteries, but still it's, it's, it's not energy. But because we have the local knowledge in the country, we could uh, do something faster and more efficient and with a direct impact compared to just writing a check to, to, to an organization. And then the third one is the passive investment. Um, and there, as I said, that's where we had the intergenerational dialogue with, 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 the, with the kids in terms of defining the screen. And one of the surprises is when we had the first, first time we defined the screen and then the investment advisor came back and said, showed us the companies that were excluded. Uh, there were even Apple was, was excluded and, and, and some other uh, companies that uh, was uh, quite an uh, awakening for us. Thank you. Abigail? I think this question of what is impactful or what is positively impactful is a really good one. It's a very timely question for me. Um, I became a mother four months ago. Yay! Um, <laughs> uh, that, that was a very impactful Q experience. Cue slideshow. <laughs> Cue slideshow. Oh, yeah, she's adorable. Yeah, exactly. Don't get me started. <laughs> but now it has become a lens with which I view everything. Is this going to make the world a better place for my daughter? And hopefully she'll live to be 80, 100, 120, who knows. Um, but I think about what different things I do, will, what kind of impact that will have on her when she's a teenager, when she's a mother, when she's a grandmother. Um, and I think at the heart of it is, are we leaving the world in a better place than we inherited it? And are we able to feel proud of what we're doing for our children and grandchildren? So, nice. Yeah, and that's a question I think that we can debate for a long time. <laughs> but on that note, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, and, uh, you know, show of hands, we have two people with microphones in the back, so we need a moment for them to get to you. Yes, one over there, and then one over here. You did say money. Uh, you want to go first, yeah. Sure. Uh, Abigail, um, back when you were writing Margins to Mainstream, um, how far did you think we would have come at this point? And are you pleased with how far we've made it? Mm. That's, a, that's a great question. Um, so we published Margins to Mainstream, I think, in 2012, 2013. Um, from the World Economic Forum. And I remember my boss at the time asking me, what would success look like? And at the time I said, well, if we could get like the largest asset managers into the impact investing space, like the Black Rocks and the Vanguards and the really large private equity firms, Bain, TPG, KKR. And that time they really weren't in the impact investing space. I thought that would be the mainstreaming of impact investing. Um, we have come past that point, um, but I don't think the impact is deep enough. Um, and I do think there is, you know, there is some greenwashing and impact washing, which is normal. Whenever something, you expand access or you expand the reach of something, it will be tweaked, adapted, molded to those current actors and players and what could work for them. Um, so I think we are where I thought we would be, but it shows that there's so much more work for us to do 
in creating greater transparency, accountability, and making sure that the right intentions are there and the right um, transparency and accountability is there to make sure that impact investment is actually having the most positive environmental and societal impact. Thank you. I think we had a question in the back. Hello, my name is Marianne Beister. I run a, a mid-sized family uh, foundation. And um, <clears throat> I'm interested in your opinions of donor advised funds. Uh, in, in our case, we have some of our funds with community foundations and also with commercial donor advised funds. And we're finding the opportunities for impact investing is limited. Doesn't, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's limited. And I'm interested in your views of how that's going to be changing with commercial DAFs and community foundations. I have some thoughts about that. So first of all, thank you for thinking about your DAF and where it's invested. I would say that is one of our largest pools of stranded assets right now. Um, a lot of times you sell a business or have a liquidity event and you get a tax write-off parking it in a DAF and then maybe some grants come out of it and maybe not, but there's really very little thought. So the fact that you're being thoughtful about it, we need more people doing that. There's um, some really wonderful DAFs, Tides, RSF, Impact Assets, just to name a few. Um, and then for those that aren't wonderful yet, um, CapShift is coming in um, and developing a product line for the fidelities of the world that haven't really thought that out. So um, that industry is being disrupted as we speak. Um, your voice and everyone else's who has a DAF um, jumping in there and saying we need better. Um, and then just really conceptualizing what is this money for? Um, and that is really our potential for catalytic capital. Um, so both on the grant side, expanding the field of impact investing, but also getting it to, you know, the deep impact. So um, that's what I see so far. And people waking up to do the work is really exciting. I think it's a perfect place to experiment. Um, we, I have a DAF with impact assets and uh, my family's on the board of National Philanthropic Trust and so uh, we're, we're intimately involved in these conversations and, and I think it's completely logical that DAFs wind up having more impact investing options because if you've already earmarked money for cancer or for healthcare or for whatever your, uh, your cause may be, uh, attacking that through multiple tools in your tool belt and using for-profit lenses and philanthropic ways to affect change seems to increase the likelihood that you'll make a dent. Thank you. Martin, Abigail, do you want to add to that on the dots? Uh, no. no? Thank you. Okay. Good. Um, other questions? There's one question here. Okay. Hi, this is Asha Jadeja from the Motwani Family Foundation. We've been in Palo Alto for about a decade now. And uh, so far, just like uh, Michael, I've been, you know, an entrepreneur, and, um, no, we see myself and I like to work with companies on the ground when the founders are they're just two founders. <clears throat> At what point in a family office do you transition from this, you know, I'm, I'm having so much fun working on this or on the solar panels or on, you know, water purification. At what point do you say, okay, you know what, I need to step back now and start thinking of organization building. It's an exhausting thought. I tried it a few times and uh, it's, I don't know how to begin. And I just heard that Leonardo <coughs> DiCaprio from, it had a foundation in LA, ran into exactly the same problem and literally just shut the doors and ran away. So for a lot of family foundations, this issue is real. And I think, uh, I mean, I'd love to have your thoughts on this. Thank you. Who would, who would like to go first? Josh, you want to try? I, I'm not sure I'm 100% clear on the question. Okay. So, maybe so you can, uh, can I repeat the question and see if I've understood it? What you're saying is that um, as an investor yourself, uh, there, is, there is value and excitement around touching and feeling and knowing the investment opportunity and doing it out of a personal interest. But it's, it's challenging to know when to step back and, and do it in a more structured and strategic way and not just looking at some individual things that excite you and that are interesting to you personally. Is, is that an okay interpretation of the question? Okay. So when do you move from individual, specific, you know, one-off things that interest you to being 
a lot more thoughtful, <coughs> strategic, and deliberate about how you deploy your. I assets. don't think those things have to exist in opposition. No. Right. I, mean, I, have, I, I have a grandfather who ran a fabric store, and he was at work every day until he was 95 years old. And so uh, th there, there's no timing in life that says I have to transition from being an entrepreneur to being a facilitator or an, or an allocator of capital. Um, and some of the largest quasi-family offices in New York City are people who run hedge funds and virtually all of their worth is, is in their, their business. Uh, and so I, I don't think that trade-off necessarily exists. It, it has to do with where you want to spend your time. Um, that being said, uh, there is a pattern amongst the families in our ecosystem uh, that there are different breakpoints in life that cause them to reevaluate their appetite for risk. And it typically has to do with uh, health situations in the family. It has to do with uh, emergence or uh, growth of the next generation. And so as you have kids that you want to empower to start making decisions about capital, there's a decent likelihood that they're not going to care about all the same things that you care about. And so giving them the voice and the tools to allow them to express themselves in ways that will uh, allow them to succeed and thrive as individuals and as allocators of capital themselves often means splintering in terms of focus. And so rarely will they want to have the same path that you've chosen or any of us have chosen. And so it, it, that it just kind of happens organically and uh, it, it's different for everybody. But, but I don't think that that trade-off exists where you have to say, look, I want to leave my heart behind and stop being an operator and focus on making sure that diversification occurs. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in that. No, and it totally depends on the goals of your family office, right? Yeah. So as long as your money is deployed that in something that's meaningful to you that you feel is responsible to people and planet, keep doing what you're doing. And to the extent yeah. that you want to really focus your energy on that, but want some of it deployed in other areas, then you can hire an expert for that. You know, like if you are want money deployed in an asset class that you're not working in, you can have that done, right? You can have it all. That family offices can have it all. <coughs> we should probably talk offline because it's so individual. <laughs> it's so individual about uh, all of those choices. The structure should reflect need. And so it really depends on the complexity of the, you know, there's the family office that I, that I run, we have 50 plus LLCs and 23 members of the family, right? And so that, that level of complexity requires an ecosystem to manage it. There are plenty of families in our ecosystem where the total family is four people. And in that scenario, you don't need the same level of complexity and often there may not be a DAF or a family foundation or the type of infrastructure you'd see in multi-generational families. And so it really depends on what the needs of the operation are and the desires, as Kristen mentioned. Thank you. Um, okay, we are at time, so I'm going to, and I also don't see any hands for questions, so I'm assuming we're done. Um, I want to say a big thank you to our panel for uh, sharing the expertise and the experiences, uh, reminding us about how important this is and how much we can do, you know, wherever each one of us starts. Uh, Kristen, you said it now, and I, I think it's really resonated with me. The time is now. Those of you who are thinking about these uh, opportunities, you know, act, and there are many, many different ways to act. We heard about some of them today, but I'm sure, you know, over the course of these days and, and thinking and engaging with this, um, you will see and, um, you know, figure out different ways to do so. By no means, I think what we are saying is everything about everything. Uh, I think there's a lot to learn. Um, big thank you to the panelists for sharing the wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie.